going to look at Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 38. Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Let's go together and pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. God, as we just go into this time of prayer, we just pray that you please bless us. Help us to understand your word a little bit better and the lessons that can be learned, learned from it. So please guide and direct me in all that we say and do today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's two people in the New Testament I really feel sorry for. We're looking at one of them today. Martha's one, the other is Thomas. I really feel bad for these people. N not because of what the Bible has done to them. It's nothing the Bible's done to them. It's what we have done to them. You see, one of them is in a person's life, it's not enough to make a judgment call about them. It just simply isn't. I want you to think back to one time you were in trouble, to one time your parents or a teacher or an authority figure got on you, and have that recorded for the next 2,000 years without people looking at the other events of your life and what would they think of you. See, when we go to Martha here, and even the commentaries I read this week, I was getting a little upset with many of them, because even Bible scholars who should really know better, whenever it was talked about Martha, they always go back to this event. This event right here, where Jesus gives a very mild rebuke. It's not this harsh thing everybody has seen. Martha's back in the back, she's making all the preparations, you know, it's hard telling actually how many people Jesus had with him. I mean, if you take with him his normal traveling crew of 12 other men, minimum. But there's always other people who was always around. So Martha's back there, always taking care of all this work. She sees her sister Mary. By the way, we, I think we overestimate Mary, personally. I think we put her up on a pedestal more than she was. My opinion is, based upon the next passage we're going to read, that Martha was actually a little bit more spiritually mature than Mary. The reason Jesus wouldn't send Mary to the back is Mary needed the moment. But when Martha asked Jesus to send Mary back, it's a very mild review. No, Mary's where she needs to be. You're worried about too many things right now. I'm not sending Mary back there. So we take this one moment and say, well, Martha's just a busybody that is just not worried about spiritual things. That's extremely, extremely unfair. Much in the same way that we take Thomas, and the one moment where he says, unless I touch the nails, I won't believe in him. Which, by the way, all the other ten disciples had to do too. We forget that when we read that account. I want us to go back into Mary, the other, or excuse me, the other event in Martha's life that's recorded in much greater detail. Because poor Martha, nobody pays attention to her in that passage. It's all about Lazarus. But when we read this next account about Martha, we see somebody who has great faith in a very difficult time. And I want us to notice she makes one of the most powerful statements we don't give her credit for. So today we're going to take a look at this. The fact of the matter is that too often in this world we take one bad moment in somebody's life and make a judgment call about who they are and we as Christians 
guy wanted to quit doing that. I want us to look at the fact that she has faith in a very hard moment. Go back to the good John chapter 11. John chapter 11, I want us to look and starting with verse 17. We're jumping kind of right in the middle of something here, but we're going to try to build the context as we go along. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. To set the context, to set the table, if you will, for this moment, for this event. When Jesus came to visit this time, it was during a death. And by the way, just putting during a death there is kind of not even get the context. It's fresh. Four days. He's been in the tomb four days. Now, in Jewish custom, Jewish culture, they would put the body in the tomb almost immediately. They, they would they would go prepare the body, and as soon as they could get the body into the tomb, they would. So this death is four days, no more than five days from happening. So Mary, Mary and Martha are still in this moment of grief. They're still in this hard time. And this was a tragic moment. There's a lot we don't know about Martha and Mary here that we try to fill in the blanks. I have read everything from... Well, it's possible that these two are not married and that Lazarus was the one who was prepared, keeping them and, and watching over them because we don't read about Martha having either a husband or a father. <coughs> Others say, well, no, that Simon the leper, that was Martha's husband or father. So whether you look at it, depending on, you know, Martha is looking one way or the other for support from Lazarus, so it's probably Mary. It is, it is very plausible, depending upon their situation, which we're not talking about. We're making a lot of guesses either through tradition or through inference in the scripture that Mary and Martha are not real firm in life right now, that it is possible that Lazarus may be the closest male relative to them, helping provide for them. And to most people, it appeared that Jesus was light. By the way, Jesus was intentionally light. When Jesus was first told about Lazarus' condition, he waited two days. Go back into verses 1 through 6 here. Same chapter. Chapter 11, start with verse 1 and read this. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary whose brother Lazarus now they said was the same one who perked him on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. No one, not even the disciples at this time, could really figure and understand this because everybody knew the reason that Mary and Martha sent for Jesus is that they believed that Jesus could heal him, that this sickness was so bad that they are bothering the teacher because they believe Lazarus is at the point of death. So they're calling Jesus, whom they know could fix this, and Jesus is sitting there saying, I'll, I'll wait two more days. And then go. So that when he arrives, to everybody who is watching, to everyone who is there, to everyone who is experiencing this, to them, Jesus is four days too late. Of course, as I used to have a Bible professor, he used to tell us, God may be late, he's always on time. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. However, keeping faith is difficult during hard moments. Keeping faith is difficult during hard moments. 
They're in their own time of personal sickness, in their own time of dealing with death, they're in their own time of injury, during their own time of tragedy, during their own time of dealing with disasters, they're in their own times of personal crisis when things seem to be crashing down on us, when it seems like the weight of the world is upon us, when it seems as if trouble itself is visiting us just like it did Job back in the Old Testament, it becomes very hard to keep the faith. Because this is an opportunity that Satan uses to try to rob us of our faith. In one of his parables, in the parable of the sower, Jesus warns about this in Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 18 through 23. As he's describing this parable and he's telling the meaning of it, he comes to this conclusion. Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes to such his way and what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who receives the seed that fell on the rocky places is the man who hears the word at once and receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who receives the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed and fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. As we're looking at this passage here, of the four seeds, three take root, two of them have trouble. Why? Because there's nothing there underneath it. When trouble or persecution come, or when the, the things of this world come along, it chokes it out, or it dries out the root. You have to develop firm root, because when trouble comes, the only thing that will help you to keep the faith is the root you have developed. Developing root is essential to being able to survive the problems of this world. What we're going to see here next is that Martha developed the roots. Her faith was firmly planted so that even though she doesn't understand what's going on, she keeps the faith. In order to keep the faith, the root has to grow deep. So let's take a look at that. We're going back in to John chapter 11, starting with verse 21. John chapter 11, start with verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives believes and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not entered, yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. While the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, 
Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? I want us to notice the first thing, the first thing we notice here. Martha went to Jesus. I think this is a very key thing here to understand. When we look at this context and we read it in its complete context, Jesus had not entered into the village. He had came to see Mary and Martha. He had come to raise Lazarus, but it's not really that time yet. Mary stayed where she was at. We don't know if she was waiting, thinking Jesus would come or what it was, but what we notice is that when they are told, Martha gets up and goes to him. She doesn't wait for Jesus to come to her. She goes to him. Mary stays where she's at. Martha doesn't wait. She goes to the feet of Jesus first. Her faith caused her to go. Her faith caused her to go. You see, Martha, then Martha made some strong statements of faith. Not a single statement. But multiple. So as she goes to Jesus and she meets Jesus, we have this wonderful back and forth conversation. By the way, if you notice, compared to two conversations, Martha's and Jesus is very deep. Very deep. I would argue that this is one of the deeper conversations Jesus had when he was on this earth. Now notice Mark Mary's as well. It's very, very superficial. That's because I think that Martha was able to handle this conversation, and Mary wasn't. But let's go back. What did Mary, or excuse me, what did Martha actually do? Number one, she believed that Jesus could have stopped death. She makes a statement, why well, a, a, an identical statement that Mary says. In their grief, they said, Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, you could have stopped this. Both Mary and Martha believed the same thing. The same thing that caused them to go and call for Jesus to begin with. If you'd been here, you could have stopped this. They believed it. They may have seen Jesus do similar miracles. They may have heard of it. Whatever it was, they believed he could have stopped this. Number two. Martha says something Mary doesn't. Please notice that. She believed God would still listen to Jesus. Listen to this statement one more time. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. In other words, Martha wanted Jesus to come here. He didn't arrive when she wanted him to. She believed that God would have listened to him if he had been there. But even though he is late, by everybody's account... Including the negative people around her. I want to talk about that in a second too. She still believed that God would still do whatever Jesus asked. This is an incredible statement of faith. In other words, her faith is not based upon what Jesus did for her today or would do for her. She believed, okay, he's dead. I still have confidence in you. I, I don't know what Martha actually had in mind. I don't know if she knew what she had in mind. She just knew that now that Jesus was here, one way or another, he would make this better. He'd make this better. I, I had somebody tell me that once. When, when I was, when Ryan and I was grieving over um, the first baby being taken, I had one of my friends says, I don't know what God will do. He has a way of making this right. Be honest with you, I probably wasn't much of a Martha back then. <clears throat> but those words stuck with me. Sometimes God doesn't always do what we want, when we want, but as believers, He still has a way of making things become right. And Martha actually understood that there in this moment. She believed in the coming resurrection. Now, this is a deep conversation Jesus has with Martha that he initiates. I know you can make this right. Your brother is going to rise from the dead. He's going to, be, he's going to rise again. 
Martha would do what any of us would do in that moment. She is thinking that Jesus is trying to comfort her with the theology of the resurrection. I mean, don't we do that when we have somebody here who has passed away? Your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, they're, they're going to rise again. That's where Martha thought Jesus was going with this, and she had confidence in it. But Jesus said, no, I am the resurrection. This is one of Jesus' great I am statements, where he is saying something about himself, where he is telling Martha, he is going to do something magnificent here. So what was her reaction to this? She repeated the good confession. She repeated the good confession. To my knowledge, and somebody can correct me after, afterwards if they know of anywhere else. To my understanding, to my knowledge of the scripture, to my, to my reading of the gospels, there are two people who make this statement prior to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pay a lot of attention to one and we ignore the second. And who the first one was? Peter. And who the second one is? Martha. Martha almost word for word repeats what Peter said. You are the Christ, the Son of God. That's a very powerful statement. It's so powerful that when we read that Jesus talked about Peter saying it, he said he's going to build his church on this. Now, I don't know, but Scripture doesn't tell us, was Martha there in that company when, when Peter said it? Did she hear Jesus talk about it in another group? I don't know where she got it from. But I want you to understand, in her moment of grief, in this deep conversation, surrounded by people who are feeding the negativity, oh, he loved them so much, look at him weak. Why didn't he come here and, and heal him? Martha says, she is one of two people in the Gospels to say, you are the Christ, the Son of God, before his resurrection. Don't tell me that this woman isn't a deep person of faith. She is. What was the next thing that Martha did? By the way, there is a lot about Martha that's very similar to Peter, isn't there? And Andrew? Martha returned to bring Mary to Jesus. She has this conversation. She knows Jesus is here. She turns and sees that Mary doesn't follow her to see Jesus. She goes back. She pulls Mary aside and says, the, the master is here to see you. It's not just about herself. She is taking a step and saying, my sister needs Jesus now too. You see, it's so easy when we're going through tragedy, when we're going through heartache, to think everything is all about us. We do that all the time. The person of faith turns around and looks for that other person they can bring with them. Mary needed Jesus. Martha knew it, so she went and got it. I want to tell you, Martha is an example of faith. She gets ignored in this passage, and it, it, it drives me nuts. She is a person of faith. What is faith? Hebrews 11, 1 tells us. And I think when you read this passage, and you think about her account here, her life is summed up in this. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's describing Martha's reaction to everything she's seeing that Jesus is doing here. She had a hope and confidence that she couldn't see. Because everything that she could see with her eyes and hear with her ears was telling her the opposite. You see, Martha then set aside and let Jesus work. John chapter 11, starting with verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Martha, or uh, Lord, Mark said Martha, the sister of the dead man, but this time there is a bad odor, 
For there have been four days. Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So he took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus had a plan no one understood, not even his disciples, not even the people closest to him. Nobody really could figure out what Jesus was trying to do here. There was great confusion. Why did he let Lazarus die? Why didn't he come sooner? Why is he here now after the fact? But Jesus had a plan that we read about from the very beginning. He knew what he was going to do. And Martha had a choice. Interfere or get out of the way. <laughs> she didn't understand what Jesus was coming to do. She was looking out for Jesus in some ways by saying, Lord, don't go to the tomb because the body has started to decompose. It smells. You don't want to go near that. Martha initially tries to interfere, not understanding. So Jesus tells her, didn't I tell you he's going to see the glory of God? At this point, Martha has a choice to continue the objection. Leave my brother's tomb alone. Don't go in there. Don't do this. Or say, okay, I'm, I don't understand a thing, and I'm going to get out of the way. Which is where we come into play. Too often we do not allow God to work. When we don't understand what's going on, we try to take life by the reins, and we try to make things happen, instead of sitting back and allow God to work. Last week was Resurrection Sunday, or Easter Sunday as we often call it, and there's so much that the scripture tells about this. There's an account where somebody tried to, to not allow Jesus to work. Matthew chapter 26, 47 through 56. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him a large crowd, a red arm with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the others of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one that kisses is the man, is the man arrest him. Going out at once G, uh, to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. Kiss him. Jesus heard, friend, replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men seized forward, or stepped forward, seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of uh, the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will uh, die by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put away at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that says it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion? But you come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I sit in the temple courts, and you do not arrest me, but this is all taking place that the writings of the prophet may be fulfilled, that all the disciples deserted him and fled. When you look at this passage here, is we look back on it so foolishly, don't we? If Jesus didn't want to be arrested, Jesus was not going to be arrested. As he said, he could call down 12 legions of, of angels. Actually, he would have needed just one. Biblically speaking, one angel has been known out to wipe out thousands of people. But one of his disciples, not paying a bit of attention to what Jesus had been saying all night, draws out a sword and decides he's going to be the one that rescues Jesus. According to the text, only two of them had swords against all these people. Not a great plan. But you know what? That's how often we are. We don't understand the plan of God. Jesus wanted to be arrested, and we try to just pull forward. 
and try to force our way and force our will. The church is supposed to be active, but the church is also supposed to be praying. That means you pray before you act. Because you never know sometimes when you're interfering with the very will or plan of God. Right now the church is in confusion. The church has been, for the most part, in our country shut down for the past year. We have just been releasing for the first time in history of the poll that church membership has fell under 50%. The church doesn't know what to do. I think the first thing the church needs to do, before the church acts, reacts, or does anything else, it needs to bend its knee and pray about what God is trying to do. Because we don't understand it. And we don't see the plan of God yet. We don't know what it is. Restoration history is such one of the most important things. One of these days, we're going to do a restoration history class. They said, at the time of the Cambridge Revival, church membership in the state of Kentucky was about like 10, 20 percent. When the largest revival in the history of the country occurred, Sometimes guys don't understand what God is doing and why he's doing it. Sometimes God, every, guys, everything looks hopeless, like there is a dead body in a tomb. And sometimes God is about to perform one of the great resurrections. And sometimes, like Martha, we need to step aside and let God do his work. And be there to fulfill it. Sometimes we just don't understand what's going on. Faith allows God to work even when we do not understand it. Guys, I am going to tell you right now, I do not understand our culture, our country, or our society today. I don't. I don't understand what is going on. Everything I see is moving more and more away from Christianity and more and more away into pure evil. On every level, I do not understand it. Here's what I do understand. Number one, we are to pray. If we are not a praying church right now, we are, we're sinning. Point one, we are to be a praying church. Number two, we already have our work. We're supposed to go cast the seeds. We're supposed to be casting seed right now. Number three, we wait to see what God does when he adds to the church. Our job is to cast seed. Our job is to pray. <coughs> There's a resurrection coming, I just don't know when. If you don't believe that, you need to go back and restudy what Jesus is teaching Martha here. Because God may be late, but he's always right on time. So what do we learn from this? Number one, Martha was a deep person of faith, and not just someone worried about work. This sermon was almost titled, and if I preach it again somewhere else, it probably will be, In Defense of Martha. Because we take the passage we read this morning, and we have said, we know all we need to know about Martha from that one passage, really. Because what John 11 tells us about her is so much more than what Luke 10 does. Her, her life is deeper than just one account. And when we judge people by one event, we do not understand who the person really is. I grow weary of our country and our society doing that right now. A person could have lived in a public life doing good work for 10 years and have 10 minutes of bad behavior and we run that person through and say, well, that person is just a horrible person because of those 10 minutes. We're setting up a standard that no one besides Jesus Christ can live up to. And our society is turning its back on him. You don't judge a person simply by one event in their life. Everybody has a bad moment. There's so much more to a person. This is why God does the judging and we don't. And faith like Martha's has to be developed. You want a faith like Martha's here that stands 
during the, the, the wind and the rain and the storms, develop it. It does not happen overnight. It cannot happen overnight. You have to develop it. Faith means to trust God even when we do not always understand what is happening. When you go back and you look, men and women of the Old Testament and the New Testament, more often than not, they did not understand what God was trying to do. More often than not, God, you do not understand what God is trying to do in your life. Let go and learn to trust. Romans tells us that God works out good for all those who believe. It doesn't mean every event's good. It just means that something good can be turned for even the worst of events. You just got to keep the faith. Which tells us what kind of faith do you have. Earlier today, we read about a parable of four different types of faith. One group did not let God give them the seed at all. They let it die and let the birds come and get it. Two other groups allowed the seed to enter into their heart, but they didn't develop their seed. They didn't water it. They didn't fertilize it. They didn't cultivate it. They didn't get the weeds out. And it died. The final group had a seed that produced 30, 60, even 100 fold. When you plant the seed in the ground, how much more vegetation do you get? Is it just one fruit per seed? No. So much more. What kind of faith do you have today? One of the things we always do with invitation time is saying that you can change it. You know that you need to believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. Forgive us of your sins, give the Holy Spirit, be baptized. We give you that opportunity to say, if you've done that, that you need to walk more with God, we'll give you that opportunity too. Whatever decision you need to make, we encourage you to make it today as you stand and sing your invitational song.